Today, we're going to take a look at a very simple way to make objects show up when they're behind a wall in URP. This is a two step process because if you just show that object exactly as it appears, it just looks like your game's broken. So we also need some way to make that object look like we're looking through a wall to give the player the feedback that, OK, this thing's blocked. My game's not just broken. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy here to help you. Ooh, me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dream become reality by helping you make objects visible even when they technically shouldn't be. In my mini golf micro game, full project on GitHub, full game on itch, both are free. There were some cases where this became problematic. I started out not even thinking about this, but it became an interesting problem to solve. What happens when the ball is too close to the wall? And when I started adding verticality into the levels, what happens when that part of the level blocked view of the ball. There's a couple ways that that could be approached. Maybe we could just cut out around the ball with some specific size. I'd be having to do some shader magic. Or should I just render the ball differently and on top of the other objects when it's behind some other object? I ended up going with the second one because honestly, it was just easier to do and seemed like it fit the game a little bit better. This became an interesting problem with how do I tell that that object needs to be rendered differently because it's behind something else. And how do I only show that part that's behind another object? And what should it look like? Luckily, Unity has a feature called render objects that helps us solve basically all of these problems. We can do something like apply a different shader or a different material to any objects based on some criteria, such as is the scene depth greater than less than whatever another object and it'll handle the replacement only for the parts of the object that qualify based on this condition. I shipped this initially with this very simple glowing shader, but as I was making this video, I decided to maybe snazz it up a little bit. So we're going to implement that same glowing shader in case that's the effect you want. But we'll also take a look at how we can take that effect and merge it into the existing ball shader just to show a little bit more of, OK, I have this effect. Now, how do I combine it with what I already have? That was a real challenge for me when I first started getting into shaders. So I hope that's going to help you if you're in a similar position. Let's take a look at how we can do all this. In your Unity project using URP, in order to enable render objects, you need to find your URP render asset. And this can be a little bit of a tricky one for you to find if you've never dealt with any of this before. So the way I find it if I'm lost is I go to edit project settings and in your quality settings here, you can find this rendering render pipeline asset. If you click on that in your project panel, it's going to highlight that render pipeline asset. Once you found the render pipeline asset, your project may not be structured like mine where the render is right next to it. It could be, but it may not be. If you look up here on the inspector, the rendering render list, that's where your render will be found. So if you click on that, it'll take you to where your render is. And this is where the magic happens. You'll want to come down and say add render feature. You probably won't have one already. So say add render feature and you're going to choose render objects. Then once you've added your render objects, because you can have multiple render features of render objects, you're probably going to want to name it something interesting, such as what I did here, ball highlight. I'm going to remove my second one since we already have this and we'll just walk through the configurations here. The first very important one is event. This chooses when in the rendering pipeline will we render with these render objects. So we're choosing after rendering opaques. That means that we will render all opaque objects and then we'll render these objects, effectively rendering these on top of all of those other objects. I don't have any transparent objects, so I don't need to worry about that. But in your game, that might be a better option. These options are listed in the order that they happen in the rendering queue. So if you're feeling adventurous, you can play around with these and see what happens with each different option. The next option, filters queue, will control which objects we want to pick to render. So we're choosing the opaque queue because my ball is opaque. And the layer mask here chooses which physics layers should we be looking at, which is very important here because it's going to do all objects on that layer. In my case, I just want the ball and the ball is on its own physics layer. So that works out perfectly. In our override mode, we can choose whether we want to override the material, the shader, or do nothing. If we do nothing, they're going to render the exact same as they normally do, just on a new pass. With the material, we can change out the material and have it pre-configured so it's going to look right, which works well if you have all the objects on that layer using the same material. If you have a bunch of enemies, they probably aren't using all the same material. You might need to use shader, which becomes a little bit more tricky to set up. I'd call that a more advanced use case, and we're not going to get into that in this video. So we're going to leave this as material and we're going to choose a material that should be swapped out. 
We've got this ball material, which gives us little dots on the ball to make it look a little bit more like a golf ball. And there's no textures, it's a little bit of shader magic in here to generate all of these fake little indentations. We're gonna replace that with a different material called ball outline, which is gonna make it glow. We do need to have the depth enabled so we can tell when we should render it because if we disable that, you see this ball immediately comes as glowing ball outline thing. So we wanna only render it when the depth is greater than some other object. So if we click play, we just do a little putt into the corner and there we go. As the ball becomes behind something, only the parts that have a depth test greater than some other object, it's gonna replace that aspect with this other material. That's the easiest way for us to do this. When the depth test is greater, that means something's blocking it. We can replace that material. Now let's take a look at how we can make this ball outline shader. So this is what this ships with. We have this Fresnel power, which as we lower it, makes it glow more. As we raise it, it makes it glow less. And we can change the color of that ball. This is fine. And the concept of what this does, we can merge in with our ball shader and just make a new material with this effect. And it'll look a little bit nicer. Let's walk through making this ball outline so we can just right click create shader graph URP and this can be an unlit shader because we don't really need to worry about the lighting calculations for this effect that makes it more performant. If we double click the shader graph window, it'll maximize to give us more space. On the left side here, we have a blackboard where we can add in variables and we want a color. Let's add in a new color, call it color is fine. And on the right side, we have this inspector. And if for any reason you didn't have either of these, there's these little two buttons at the top right, blackboard and inspector. We'll select the color that'll take us over to node settings. We want this to be HDR so we can make it bloom and glow. And let's assign it some orange color. And we also had a float value that was the Fresnel string. Let's add that. And again, in the node settings, change the mode to slider. Let's give it just a value between zero and eight and a default of one. Let's take that Fresnel strength, just drag that into our open space. And then on the right side, we've got this blue port, drag that over to the right and search for Fresnel. We're going to take that to Fresnel effect power. Now in the graph inspector with the Fresnel strength node still selected, if we adjust the value, you can see what this power does. As we lower it, the whole object goes white. As we increase it, it increases the intensity only at the edge. That's why you saw as we increased the power, that ball was glowing less because it was intensified only to the edge versus the lower values, we have more of the color being multiplied in. And that's exactly what we're gonna do is take our color, drag that right port out to a multiply A, that just takes it to the top one, then the Fresnel effect out to the multiply B, and we can see that same Fresnel effect just with the color. And again, as we adjust that default value, we see that edge retains the color and the middle becomes black. So if we just took this out to our base color, save that, if you don't already have a material with your shader selected, if you right click create material, it'll create a new material with that shader. So let's just do that and call it ball outline two. And I'll move it to my materials folder. And we need to find our renders again, URP render, find this ball outline on our render objects, pick ball outline two and make sure to pick the one that is a material, not that comes from the shader graph. And if we play one more time, let's see how it looks. All right, it looks exactly like what we see here, right? We've got black in the middle and an orange outline. That's not quite what we had before. We had it white in the middle, right? This ball happens to have a white set of vertex colors. So in our ball outline, if we just press space and look for vertex, we can get vertex color. And before we go into base color with this multiply with the Fresnel effect, we can add our vertex colors in and take that out to the fragment base color. Save that, it'll recompile the shader, and here we go. This is back to where it was before. If we just drive up that intensity, it should turn more orange. Now, when I was first learning shaders, it was really hard to take this type of concept and merge it into something else that already existed. If it's already in shader graph, that's relatively easy because we already know exactly what we wanna do, right? We wanna take this Fresnel effect and apply it on top of the ball. So let's do that. We have all this stuff going on to have tune stepped lighting and some stuff to generate those fake indentations on the ball. Now, what we would like to do is just add in that Fresnel, right? For a glow effect, we may not actually care about all of the stuff going on here, but we do know that we want to add it on top of the base effect, which makes this very easy to implement. We can just intercept whatever's going into the base color and add whatever our new effect is on top of it. So we need to add two values to the blackboard, just like what we did before. Plus we'll just add it called color. 
Again, open up our graph inspector, change the mode to HDR. I'm gonna leave it black for now and add in that second float, the Fresnel strength. Configure it in the node settings as a slider from zero to eight. I'm gonna leave the default as zero. Let's do exactly what we did before, Fresnel strength into the Fresnel power. Let's move this stuff over. Fresnel into a multiply with the color. And let's add the base effect with our Fresnel. For glowing effects, it's very easy to add this in because we're literally just adding in an intensified color on top of whatever else is happening in the rest of our shader. The Fresnel effect is acting like a mask to say only where this shows up white or really wherever this shows up non-black is where we're going to have the effect. And the more white it is, the more intense we're going to have that color come through. As we're increasing the Fresnel power, we're masking out more areas and forcing that effect more to the edge of our ball. By multiplying with the color where we have zeros, the black areas, our color just won't be applied because anything multiplied by zero is zero. And where it's white, we're going to get that full intense, whatever color is provided. Let's then take the add node output to the fragment base color, save it. And the cool thing is we don't ever have to leave play mode because Unity will recompile our shaders for us. So let's take our ball material, copy paste it. We'll call it ball outline glow. And if we set up our color, let's give it a bright glowing orange and a Fresnel strength of, I don't know, four. And in the preview, we can take a look and it's gonna look like this plus our bloom if we replace our render to now use this material. So again, in our renderers, URP renderer, just replace that ball outline with our ball outline glow. There we go. Now we can see our ball through the walls and it looks, I don't know, I think it looks a little bit nicer than before. It still looks like a ball, just, okay, hey, I'm seeing it through the wall. And we can, of course, play with our Fresnel strength. We want it to be more glowy, less glowy, more intense, less intense. And obviously with a very low intensity, it just looks like the game's broken. Why can I see this ball? Maybe it looks like it's on top of the wall. And as I move around, it just, it looks broken, right? So that's why we'd like some kind of glow to indicate, okay, yeah, you're seeing this thing through the wall. Don't worry, it's not broken. And outside, it looks fine again. Of course, it doesn't have to be just, okay, let's make this thing glow, right? It's a totally stylistic choice for your game and you can make whatever VFX you want to make it mesh into the look and feel of your own game. If you're interested in a structured approach to learning Shader Graph Basics, I've got a course, link in the description, where you can go through the process of making a bunch of different shaders, a bunch of different effects, and learn how to connect all this stuff together and what all these things do. That's a great way to show your support for the channel if you're getting value out of these videos. Other ways you can support are, I know it's coming to the time of Black Friday sales and all of these things, so if you use the affiliate links down in the description, to do your Black Friday shopping on the Unity Asset Store and Humble Bundle, that helps me out tremendously and it comes at no additional charge to you. You can also get yourself some Llama Academy merch or become a YouTube member or a Patreon supporter. Those last two will get your name up here at the end of every video, access to a members exclusive Discord, and a shout out starting at the awesome tier. At the tremendous tier, there's Nick5454. At the awesome tier, there's Ivan, Ifiabolus, Mustafa, Sneden, and Angel. And there's, of course, all of these great supporters as well. Thank you all for your support. I am so incredibly grateful.